Mr. Thomas knows that I'm a roamer when I have the microphone. So he told me that if I wanted to be on camera, I needed to stay in this general area because we are recording the event here tonight. So I'm very going to kindly move to this side so that folks on camera don't have to see me. Okay. Um, on behalf of our staff, our students, our Board of Education, um, I want to welcome you all to our community forum tonight as we begin or actually take the next step in our master facilities uh, planning process. My name is Mike Perevka. I'm the superintendent of schools here at Greater Latrobe, and I really do appreciate you giving up your time um, to come here tonight and, and hear our first presentation. Um, you may say to yourself, why does the Greater Latrobe School District need a master facilities planning process? And I would say this to you, I'm starting my 25th year at Greater Latrobe, and time has flown for me. I've been very fortunate to spend 24, 25 years in this school district. Unfortunately, a majority of our, our buildings, our facilities in this school district have been untouched um, in those 24, 25 years. Um, when you look at Bagley Elementary, Mountain View Elementary, uh, those schools were last renovated in the late 1990s. Um, the junior high school was done right as I was starting at the junior high school. That was 1998, and the senior high school followed. Um, fortunately, past administrations in the Greater Latrobe School District have taken important steps to upgrade certain facilities. We have the Arnold Palmer Wellness Center uh, behind the high school here with Rossi Field, Graham Sabota Field, and we have the new LES, which is in the city of Latrobe. I say new LES, but do you realize that the new LES is actually four years old? Those administrations took important steps for us, but it's time for this administration to take a bold step, a bold step forward to identify what our needs are in those other facilities within our school district. Mountain View, Bagley, the junior high school, the senior high school, Memorial Stadium, which I didn't include, last done in 2001, and our central administration office. That process coincides with our comprehensive planning, which, is, which just went on in the school district, but also trying to figure out what do our schools need to look like as we move a quarter of the way through the 21st century? I haven't graduated all that long ago, but school looks different today than it did when I graduated. I think if you took a tour of LES, the new LES, which by the way is four years old, you would see that that facility matches what learning looks like today. Our other facilities do not, and, and that's okay. But again, that's that bold step that we're about to take to figure it out. As the superintendent of schools, it's not my sole responsibility to figure out what our schools should look like. As a matter of fact, my wife would tell you that it's probably a good thing that I'm not the only person that's going to figure that out, unless you want bare skin and rugs and, and terrible movie memorabilia hanging from the walls. It's important that we include many people in this process. And it's important that we have the appropriate people leading the process. Our Director of Facilities Operation and Planning, Mr. Kurt Thomas, is a certified architect. He's got the background, he's got the knowledge to help lead us through this process. He was integral in the design of the new LES in that building. To my left, your right, we have representatives from SHP, an architectural firm from Ohio, who has done more than a hundred, hundreds of master facility planning processes. You're going to hear from them tonight too. Let me be clear with you. We are looking at the next 25 years in this process. I'm excited about this. I'm excited to match facilities 
with the first class education that we provide each and every day in our classrooms. I don't know what that means. I don't know what these facilities will look like. That's not my job. But in addition to including the folks that are in this room today, we're gonna to talk to teachers, we're gonna to talk to principals, we're gonna to talk to administrators, we're gonna to talk to community members, we're gonna to talk to taxpayers, and we want your input. Because it's everyone that's in this room today who are going to benefit from the facilities that match our 21st century education that we're providing each and every day. I appreciate you giving up your time tonight and being here. Hopefully you'll leave here tonight and you'll go out and you'll tell three or four other people, hey, come to the next community forum. Be a part of the educational design team. Be a part of the facilities team. You're going to see a year-long process identified here tonight in this presentation that's going to help us to build our future and what our facilities should look like for the future. For our students, for our teachers, for our community, for Greater Latrobe. Again, I appreciate your time. I welcome you here tonight. And at this point, I'll turn it over to Mr. Thomas. I love following you. I know you do. Look, did you see how I moved right to the middle where the camera is? It's because you will look 100% smaller than me in that camera. <laughs> you just reduced like a half an hour worth of work and slides to your three minute presentation, so I don't have to present anything now. So you share all these. It's what I do, Kurt. I, I help you out, buddy. <laughs> no, I appreciate that. It's good. Uh, thanks, Mr. Premka, for the introduction. And, uh, thank you all for again for being here tonight. Uh, as Mike said, you know, he mentioned you know things we haven't touched our facilities. In some sense, that's true. I mean, we haven't done major renovations, we haven't done major improvements, but we have done capital improvements, and that's based upon our district capital improvement program uh, that we've had in place for the last since my time being here since 2015. Uh, so we have identified and we walked through our buildings to see what needs updated as things begin to fail, as things begin to need upgrading. Um, you know, we do that mainly because we don't want to have to get to a point where we have deferred maintenance. So we're not extending the life of components or major systems beyond their absolute useful life. So we're trying to stop, and that's why you kind of see that 20 year period in our history um, of replacement. Uh, you know, we obviously want to maintain optimal learning environment for our district and for our teachers and for our students. Uh, so there's things that we have to address on an annual basis. And, you know, as a five-year rule on capital, we plan, obviously, for short-term pieces, so that's a five-year piece, but also the long-term. And that's where this kind of comes in, this process comes in place, because these are things, you know, 10, 15, 20 years down the road that we're discussing. So what that program is, is, and I'll pre preface this with, all this information is online. I put together last year to the school board of directors and the school authority a large document that really went into detail. So if you need some you know, sleep material, there's a lot of detail out there as far as the, basically the status of our schools. So it's a point in time kind of overview of where they stand as far as the age, condition, and their wear. From there, we take basically a needs a summary. So we identify a matrix, we develop a matrix to identify those pieces and parts and what's the most important that need to be addressed. And from there, we put together a five-year willing capital. Uh, Mr. Watson shares every year in our budget presentation, his budget presentation, uh, that we have basically $200 million worth of capital assets that we maintain every year. So as those begin to age, we have to have a five-year rolling picture uh, as far as what needs to be improved in that time period. Also within there, we have our enrollment summary where we talk about our current trends and our uh, historical trends. In my, my short time here, you know, I've kind of seen that we've been stagnant, obviously. And I would think over the last decade, we've been stagnant, if not declining, when it comes to our enrollment. So when we talk about the history of our buildings and the age of the buildings, you know, as far as renovations, you see that tie to enrollment, especially in the 70s when 
Latrobe was, you know, kind of a larger capacity as far as the Rollins and uh, the city. And then also there's an energy assessment piece that we are also doing a partnership with Siemens Industry to uh, work on our energy consumption. So as Mike quickly ran through our entire history of our buildings, uh, someone spent a long time trying to put together a pretty slide for you guys to understand our history. Um, so 19, early 1950s, Bagley and Mountain View were constructed. So the original buildings were constructed at that time period, also with Memorial Stadium. Uh, those buildings still stand, that's still part of those elementary schools today. Uh, in 1960, there was addition of Mountain View. In 1966, this building was built uh, as far as a new high school for Greater Little Trove, which was uh, formated in 1962. In 1974, we saw a big expansion um, of the junior high, which is now the junior high, was the high school annex in 1974, and with uh, large additions to Mountain View and Bagley. At this time, also, old, I would call old LES, but the old high school was operating as an uh, elementary school. 1990, we saw around renovations, which is mainly uh, due to the change in education. Uh, if you remember, 19, late 1990s, you know, computer labs was a craze, technology labs, uh, having computers in the classroom. So a lot of this renovation pieces were done because of the uh, change in curriculum and how we deliver education. So large renovations in 1998 at Bagley Junior High, Mountain View in 99, uh, Memorial Stadium saw addition and renovation. To and this building had a addition in 2001 and renovations in 2003. Uh, 2011, we purchased the now uh, central office, uh, I call downtown Latrobe, and renovated that. Uh, junior high saw partial renovations in 2014, uh, which would be the main hallway, or art, art gallery hallway and the entrance. And also the athletic and wellness complex was completed in 2014, which is at the rear of this site. And then in 2018, uh, we completed Latrobe Elementary School. Put all that together, our average original construction time, not including new LES, is over 50 plus years old. That includes the additions to the senior high school and the additions to a Memorial Stadium. So that does kind of skew that number. So if you look at strictly original construction of buildings, we're over 60 plus years old as far as original construction. It's been 20 plus years since our last major renovation across the district. So again, as we start talking about replacement of those components that are meeting their end of useful life, things, as you see, you know, late 90s, things we put in place 98, 99, 2000, they're all kind of stacking up against us in a row there. From that um, program that was put in place and presented to the school board of directors and school authority, uh, there's basically three major recommendations given. One is to, as far as maintenance, continue to increase our yearly costs of four to five percent to our annual budget to address these failures and these pieces of parts that need to be replaced annually. Continue to fund our capital improvement fund. So we've set aside a separate fund that deals with capital improvements. And we do have a line item each year that we do transfer money to that fund. Short term, we need to continue to address life and safety issues. High priorities, health and safety of our students and teachers and staff maintain code compliance in our buildings, and also address critical infrastructure. So as we deal with boilers, uh, rooftop units, those things are uh, roof replacements, those things are of high demand. But as far as addressing the long-term recommendations, uh, the recommendation was to issue an RFQ, which is a request for qualifications or proposals from a third party to develop an educational facilities master plan, and also an RFQP for a third party to conduct an energy performance audit. And I stress the educational facilities master plan because the one piece that my program didn't put in place is the educational component. There's no discussion as far as how we educate students in our buildings. It's strictly bricks and mortar infrastructure type piece. So it's critical as we start discussing things uh, as far as needs to make sure we address the educational component too because it's been, again, 20 some years since we've addressed that in a wholeheartedly within our buildings. So within that piece, we wanted to have a third party that had a master plan and educational visioning background, and also ALP certified certifications like Mr. Kremka stated, I am not certified architect, I'm a licensed architect, there is a difference. Um, 
but as far as having a certification, which I do not have, is this ALFP, which is a Credit Learning Environment Plan. So I think that was important to have that member uh, tied to this team. That's why we reached out and tried to find a third party. The master plan components that we put out that we wanted to have is a group that could review and supplement our district's capital improvement plan. We wanted to define and refine our district's educational vision plan, which we just went through a process of the comprehensive plan review. We wanted a team that has a strong background in education that can help us uh, also define and refine that process. Facilitate key stakeholder engagement and informational meetings. So one of the reasons we're here tonight, this isn't something the district put on strictly on its own. Uh, SHP has a strong background in this, and it's a key point that we wanted to have throughout this entire process. Translate existing and future learning models to programming and spatial arrangements. So I'm looking for that RFQ for that uh, firm. You know, it's one thing to be an architect, it's another thing to be an architect of educational abilities. It's a special skill. Uh, it's a special skill set to deal with, say deal with, sorry. Uh, work with teachers, work with administrators, work with uh, community members that focus in schools because our schools touch everybody. You know, this is a place where students learn, where our teachers work, it's where our community come together as far as community centers. So it's a, it's a kind of a building that touches everybody. Uh, help develop a strategic project planning process, incorporate sustainability, market analysis, and explore funding options. So those were keys that we had, uh, that we wanted to have as far as a master plan. The uh, school board directors uh, allowed me to go out and issue that RFQ. We received, um, we reached out to 12 firms. We received, we shortlisted down to three. We conducted interviews of those three, and SHP uh, by and far was the one that we all felt comfortable in the facilities committee uh, in hiring. Uh, the school board hired them in November. Uh, we just started this process here in January. Um, so I'm getting, you know, very excited to see how this process goes and uh, work through a program, hopefully, that is, as I expressed to others, that, you know, we're not going, we may be driving this process, but we're not steering it. The folks that are here today, the folks that will be here in the future, the ones who steer this process to where we go for the future of our facilities. For more information, and if you want to get into that capital improvement plan, you can go to our website, it's there. Uh, you can thumb through it. Again, there's a lot of data. It shows a, a very good point in reference as far as where our buildings are district-wide. Uh, Ms. Pell is showing me how to do this QR code, so I learned how to put that on the slide, so you can scan that if you want to go straight to it. Um, but again, it's been a fun process, but as Mike said, he can't be the only one making decisions as far as the future of our schools. I can't be the only one driving or steering the ship to how we select and do what we want to do as far as our district-wide, our buildings. So with SHP being hired, um, I'm going to turn this over to Mr. Uh, Thackeray, but I've had the pleasure, pleasure of working with them for the last couple months and looking at our facilities, touring our facilities. When we interviewed uh, SHP, uh, they came out prior to and toured our facilities. They met with our staff here at the high school started already talking to them about their educational vision and how we deliver education in our district. Uh, very opening is in the presentation they had a, and we'll get to this a little bit later, but they already discussed, you know, how do we uh, communicate this information to the general public and open up a website. So they've already had that process going in place, so we do have a website that you can go for more information, where you kind of start piling all this uh, information and data there. Um, they're a firm that knows what they're doing. They've done it well. Mike mentioned they're from Ohio, uh, which, you know, geographical location of an architectural firm doesn't drive who we hire. Uh, we've had, you know, different architects from the region that we also interviewed. But I think uh, what they bring to the table, what they've done over their years, uh, 120 plus years as a firm, uh, but also with this piece, uh, being the leaders they are within the educational field uh, when it comes to architecture, I think it's critical. So I'm glad to have them as part of our team. I'm glad to have this process going. And Thankful that you guys all came here today. So thank you. Mr. Thackeray. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. Good evening. On behalf of SHP, we are extremely happy to be here working with you. Um, we've done, Josh and I personally have done this over a hundred times. Um, 
we actually started this process of engaging communities to drive designs and drive master planning in 1990. So I personally have been doing this for 32 years, a few years after I started. But uh, I'm an architect and a partner with SHP, and um, I love working with communities and with teachers and with students. So that's why I do it. Uh, also on our team, um, Carrie Malatesta and Jeff Parker are the two faces up here tonight that you don't see. They are integral to the next phase of this process of engaging your staff, your students, your community in developing an educational vision that can translate into the built environment to support that educational delivery. Josh, who I already mentioned, he can introduce himself here a little bit more too, uh, but is our senior educational facility planner and an architect, and I've had the pleasure of working with him for many years. So, anyway, um, our experience, I mentioned the first one here, um, that we were the first architect in the country to develop this engagement process to really to drive things, and that was in 1990, again, 32 years ago. Um, we're one of the top uh, educational design firms in the Midwest and in the country as far as that goes. Uh, we founded an institute, 9 billion schools, that's really to promote lifelong learning, which I think everyone in education is on board with. Don't know who wouldn't. And uh, we specialize in student-centric design. So understanding how students work, understand how teachers interface with them, and that we know somewhat, but that's where Carrie and Jeff particularly specialize. And this is what it's all about. In public schools, there is no such thing as a master plan, a facility master plan, that is not educationally fantastic, is not financially responsible, and is not community supported. If it is, I mean, they're out there, but they don't work if they don't accomplish those things. So that's the foundation of what we do and what we will do with you and your entire community to the extent that anyone and everyone wants to be involved in this. And Mr. Thomas mentioned this. There is a website that is open and you can scan that QR code and go to it. And this presentation from tonight will be put in there so anyone Everyone who wants to go there and see the detail of this may go at any time in the future. It's not on there yet. We finalize it shortly before airtime. Um, and the process will continue to be documented and shared in this way. So it is completely open and transparent. You will be able to see everything that the educational visioning team sees. You will be able to see everything that the community advisory team that will be charged with working through the nuts and bolts of developing a facility master plan that meets the three criteria on that previous slide. Also with the community, because all of that, they, they will vet the process and guide the process and share options with the community that will tell us when it's successful in being community supported. Mr. Predovich. Good evening. Uh, everybody hear me okay? Can you hear me in the back there? Great. Thank you. Um, I'm Josh Predovich, uh, architect with SHP. I've been with SHP, I think, 21 years, I think, at this point. Um, started working uh, as a designer architect, got into the master planning side of things, and so I've been uh, working through this process that we're going to walk you through tonight in some fashion, probably for at least um, 15 or 18 of those 20 years. Um, what we'd like to do tonight is we're going to share this process with you. This is going to be about a year-long process, and so all of you, we hope to see you at, at more of these types of meetings as we go through this and, and work with you and some of the teams that I'm going to explain to you tonight. Um, but you'll see this graphic up here um, kind of repeated, and this is uh, sort of outlining the sort of five steps that we're going to go through before we uh, make a final recommendation to the board. Um, so um, what I'd like to do is I'm going to start by looking at the timeline. Um, if you see up behind me here, um, this effectively is a, is a calendar showing the next 12 months of activities that we're going to work with your district um, to, to work uh, 
uh, towards that master plan goal. Um, and so it starts, if you see up the top, there are a couple of teams there that we've created, and there's a district steering team that's been meeting. Um, it's kind of a, uh, a, a group that uh, the Kurt's team has put together, a facilities team, um, that has a couple of board members associated with it. There obviously is your, uh, your superintendent and some other folks that have been meeting on a regular basis. And those folks are going to meet all the way through this process, and they're kind of our guides, if you will. Um, we call that the district steering team, and the idea is, is that we get together with that team on a regular basis to walk through each of these phases. Um, and what you can see below that is later in the sort of July through November time frame, you'll see that the finance advisory team will get together. And that's when, at that point in time, we're going to start to have some master plan options to discuss um, and start to put some numbers towards those. And so those are two teams that will continue. Thank you, sir. Um, the, the big blue bar up here, the sort of light bulb blue bar, that's facilities and, and site assessments, and that started back in January, and it's, it's proceeded forward. And that information is the information that we're going to uh, present to you tonight. Um, that's foundational information that we'll use uh, throughout the entire process. Um, and so we want to sort of show you where, uh, where we are right now. Um, each of those yellow bars that you see up there um, are opportunities for us to come back and have another community forum similar to this one. Uh, we can present uh, additional information, so those are opportunities for community members uh, to be involved in the process, uh, to hear where we are, um, sort of any, any one of those touch points. And we've identified three, there might end up being more. Um, and then the next bar that you'll see up there, starting uh, in March, is the educational visioning uh, bar. So that's where Carrie and Jeff are going to be uh, working with your teams uh, to think about what the future of education might be for the next 10 years in your district. Um, and they go through some really exciting exercises. I'm going to show you a little bit about uh, some details of that after we talk about the facility assessments. Once we get through the educational visioning, then the next, uh, the next step is going to be taking what we learned in educational visioning, what we think is the delivery models that you may want to consider for any of the future uh, buildings, facilities, improvements. Um, and we're going to take those back to your existing buildings and think about whether or not your, building, your existing facilities will support those models. Um, so there might be some instances where we go back to uh, elementary school, junior high school, senior high to see if educational delivery will be successful in the current configuration or if we have to think about what modifications would be required in order to support the future of education. Um, and that's going to lead us to solutions um, and also assessing dollars to uh, any of those uh, different changes that we need to take place. Um, once we get through educational visioning, the visioning test fit, um, we think uh, potentially have another opportunity for community forum to get everybody up to date on uh, sort of the information that's been uh, produced to, up to that point. And then that last red bar that you see there, um, it's, uh, it's a team that, that uh, we've been really successful in, in working through master planning processes, uh, which is the community advisory team, we call that the CAT. Um, and the success we've had with the community advisory team is, is uh, creating a group uh, that the sec essentially is going to work through master plan so we're going to have all this foundational information with the facility site assessments, we're going to have the educational visioning, we're going to have the visioning test fit, and we're going to be able to put all that information together in front of this community advisory team um, and work with them on master planning uh, and thinking about different options uh, for the future of your district. And so that's a really exciting process where it's a culmination of all these things that we've uh, worked on throughout the year. Um, and there will be opportunities, obviously, for uh, you folks to be involved in the community advisory team. Um, so we'll start talking about how to um, for, sort of put that team together probably May, June, probably in that time frame. And then once the community advisory team has had a chance to work through some master planning options and really start to think about uh, how they will affect the future and again going back to educationally fantastic and uh, financially responsible and community supported, um, then we think there's that opportunity again to go through one more round of community forums um, and talk about all the different options that are there, the process that we use, before ultimately making uh, a final recommendation to the Board of Education, which is that, that last part of there in December. So, um, what we'd like to do tonight is um, present to you some of the information that uh, has come out of the facility and site assessment. Um, and I apologize because some of this stuff is, is kind of the dry um, numbers and, and figures, but I want to talk to you about how we go through this process, why it's important, and why it ultimately uh, kind of, um, it forms the foundation, if you will, uh, of allowing us to uh, have a really uh, institutional knowledge of, of your facilities 
um, as we proceed forward. So um, you can see up here, obviously it begins with data and research, but the way that we go through this process is first we, we pull uh, as much information, existing uh, as-built drawings, existing uh, facilities conditions as possible. And Kurt has alluded to this uh, report that he's produced. Um, this report is, is probably head and shoulders above any information that we would typically get from a school district client. Um, I can't tell you of another client that we've started at this point. We, we typically are uh, having to dig through a lot more information um, in order to get to just this level of where we already are. So uh, kudos to, to Kurt for, for pulling all that information together, and I know that was a long process. Um, we've taken that report, we've also pulled your ASBEL drawing information, and then as the team has mentioned, we've been through the facilities now. I think most of the facilities we've been in probably at least three times. Um, and we've been everywhere. We've been in crawl spaces and mechanical spaces and up on roofs and, and just really trying to understand everything, not just uh, the classroom spaces, but also, did I just lose the mic? Yeah, okay. Um, but also just all the mechanical spaces, uh, all the support spaces, um, every, every space in the building we've been through, I think, at least once. And we're pulling all that information together so that not only can we take a look at the information that Kurt uh, has produced, but we can also look at that from the lens of, of our understanding of school, of school construction. Um, Todd and I obviously have been through a number of buildings throughout our history, um, new facilities, old facilities, renovated facilities, and we're trying to pull all that information together so that we can put together the, the best understanding of costs of what it will take in order to maintain your facilities, not only for the five-year projection that Kurt has put together, but even projecting out maybe even 10 years. Um, because that is forming a foundational basis for us so that we can understand um, how much it's going to cost to maintain your facilities, and then we can talk about also what's required to improve your facilities. Um, so we've been through that process. As also part of that, we've also interviewed uh, administrators. We've talked to the administration team, talked to the principals in each of the buildings, we've talked to the custodians, we've talked with your uh, facilities maintenance team, just to try to get the, the broadest understanding as we can of, of your facilities. Um, and from that, um, we've had the opportunity, obviously, to not only take a look at the district as a whole, but then also drill down into each of the buildings. So uh, most of this information, I'm not going to read each of these bullet points. You guys know your district better than we do. We're trying to catch up to you. Um, but ultimately, you know, we find that it's important to zoom all the way out so that we can zoom back in and really have a good uh, perspective of, of sort of where you are as a district. Um, I mean, some of you may not know that you're 72 square miles and, and just some of the things about, you know, the number of residents and sort of where your uh, current enrollment stands. We are going to talk a bit about enrollment. So you see that 3,398 students um, and obviously your five school buildings and your district office and, and stadium and other district owned properties. Um, we're, we're trying to take as broad a look as we can uh, at, at everything, and every, every piece that the district currently owns. So we're going to start with the school buildings, and what Todd and I are going to do is we're going to go back and forth a little bit here to, to talk about some of this information. And again, I'm not going to go through and read each of the bullet points. We've already talked a bit about, um, Mike uh, obviously discussed some of the, of the timelines of when these facilities were constructed. Um, Kurt put together the great graphic showing each of the years of when the facilities were built and when they were renovated or added on to. Um, but some of the things that I do want to point out for each of the facilities is um, as we've gone through the assessment process, we've been looking at um, some of the enrollment um, and capacity information because I think there's, there's, some, uh, there, there's some keys to be understood or to be um, uh, utilized as we talk about uh, the actual enrollment and the capacities of each of the facilities. And so as you take a look at, at Bagley, for instance, um, you'll see the current enrollment at 512, the calculated capacity at 720. Um, when we're looking at that number, that, that, uh, that calculated capacity, that's based on your, your educational plan right now. How many students are we trying to maintain student-to-teacher ratio um, through the elementary grades, into the middle school grades, into the high school grades? And so that's, that calculated capacity is based on your educational plan and you'll see here at Bagley, it's at 71%. I want you to kind of pay attention to those as we go through each of the facilities because we do think that that information is key uh, in sort of understanding the relationship of the amount of square footage that you're currently maintaining and the number of students that you're currently educating. So with that, Todd and I kind of bounce back and forth. All right. Okay. Is it working okay? Can you hear me? 
Can you hear me? <laughs> this is a list that we'll share with you on each building. Um, it's slightly different on each building, but there are a lot of similarities. Um, besides what Kurt put together, we, we took this and looked at it a little further out. Um, he was putting together a concise five-year plan. Um, and we also pulled in 10 years out, potentially a little over, to make sure that in planning, we had a good perspective on what your real costs are for keeping your buildings long term versus any other option that might fall in the master plan. So repaving, um, and at Bagley in particular, expanding the parking and creating better traffic flow, some of those things are included in this. Roof replacement, door and window replacement. Uh, there are wood windows in the building that aren't holding up as well as you would hope. Um, interior finishes, student storage is shown there in the picture. The student wardrobes are out of the hallway, all clustered together, hanging coats side by side, all that kind of thing. Um, safety and security, that includes a lot of different things, from fire alarm systems to how you control people getting in and building and who they can get to. Uh, plumbing fixtures, heating, ventilation and air conditioning, uh, lighting replacements, technology upgrades, um, basically technology, the equipment, the interface with the students has to be replaced within 10 years anyway. <laughs> Getting get parts for the stuff that's three years old. Uh, and furnishings. So, the, the number, we have a range here. The 15 million is taking Kurt's five year plan and putting the last two years of inflation on top of that. It have been higher than normal, or higher than historically uh, projected. And then we took a projection based on you know, interviews with the principals and maintenance people and walking through the facilities and looking out 10 plus years. Um, to give you a range of 15 to 20 million is the likely cost of renovating that building to a good condition. Yes. That's fine. All right. So we also, going through the buildings and talking to the staff, uh, we have an opinion on the educational adequacy. And this is a fairly soft look at our part. But I basically use three categories. Poor, fair, good. Okay. And your buildings have been well maintained. So there's a lot of good stuff in these. Um, and most of the building is in fair condition. I mean, carpets are old. Um, furniture is old. And, and not necessarily what the teachers would want to have today uh, to support their educational delivery. And it's, it's fair. The areas that are in that same condition, but without windows, which research has shown that students perform and learn better in spaces that have good daylight and views. Windowless classrooms in those conditions, I believe, are educationally poor. Okay. And I think some of the people I've talked to would agree with that, and maybe you would too. Okay. All right. And the last piece was taking that 15 to 20 million and comparing it against current projections of new construction costs. And that comes out to 57% of replacing with a new building. And in the educational planning industry, it's typically in the 60 to 70% range where we recommend districts consider replacing a building if it costs that much to renovate. So congratulations. All of your building based on just condition assessments are slightly or well below that 60% mark. This does not yet include that educational vision in what you and your kids and your staff think these buildings should do in the future. That's the next step that will be overlaid onto this and integrated with these costs to see what it takes to make them warm, safe, dry, and educationally appropriate. Okay. All right, so we'll, uh, you're gonna see the same format, obviously, for each of your facilities. And so Latro, it being the newest facility uh, that the district currently owns, obviously you can see the information up here. As Mike said, it's four years old, four years old. 
Um, the building area, you see, you see the site area up there. Um, current enrollment and, and calculated capacity, again, the current enrollment at 629, the calculated capacity at <coughs> And so again, you can see the utilization factor up there of about 70%. And again, so again, keep that in mind as we go through here. We're going to sort of touch on that a little bit more in the summer. All right. So there aren't a lot of things we think that building needs in the next 10 years. Um, resurfacing of asphalt um, is something you should anticipate closer to the end of that 10 year period. Um, an allowance for rooftop air conditioning and heating unit replacement. Uh, they're fairly sophisticated energy recovery and all this that you know, if they last 15 years, they've done really well. Um, some classroom technology, again, technology the devices projecting on the walls, they're outdated within 10 years. So. We think this building is, the rated this very good, above my standard rating. <laughs> Got a wonderful building there. And uh, it's not in the replacement ratio mode. Okay, so looking at Mountain View again, same format, original construction of 52, you see the additions and renovations there. Building area of about 99,000 square feet, 19 acres. Uh, the current enrollment, 557, and uh, calculated capacity of about 744. And see this utilization rate here is about 75%. Okay. So Mountain View, again, Mountain View and Bagley are almost the same building. They're flipped, and there's a little bit of difference to them other than that, but very similar. Um, Mountain View has better parking, but still needs to be resurfaced you know, within 10 years. Roof replacement, doors and wood windows, uh, all these pieces are the same. Until we get to plumbing, um, the piping, the supply piping in that building is having pinholes pop up. You have another building that this happens into. So we're anticipating replacing the copper supply piping in the building if you plan to keep it long term. HVAC and boiler room. This picture happens to be from your boiler room there. Mountain View is in a unique position compared to uh, Bagley in that it's a low grade boiler room with an area way and there is water that gets into the boiler room and it's causing corrosion. Um, anyway, walking through it throughout the option, if you have extra space in the building and you do, why don't we move that boiler room upstairs where that equipment can be properly maintained as being used long term? It's a possibility, but that's on there. And the other things are the same as the other. Um, and you're still in the same 15 to 20 million toss range. Without windows, poor condition. With windows, fair condition. 57% uh, of replacement cost. The junior high school uh, again original construction in 74 you see the additions in 2001 the partial renovations 98 2014 building area 162 um, you see the current enrollment 557 you see the calculated capacity of 1032 and you'll see the utilization rate here at 54 percent um, uh, one note junior high school and senior high school the utilization numbers are a little skewed because of ninth grade right we've got a lot of ninth graders that are spending most of their time in the junior High school building. We also have world language that's happening uh, for all 9 through 12, we're actually currently at the junior high. So you're going to see a lower utilization rate at the junior high, a higher utilization rate at the high school. Those numbers are probably slightly skewed because the enrollments don't reflect that. Any comment you would like to make about the circular motif of this piece of architecture? I'm, I'm trying to not, to, okay. uh, to, to not, trying to stay away from that having any value judgments on that. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Privilege. <laughs> All right, for the facility assessment, repaving and site improvements, um, the metal wall panels that surround the second level of this building are original. Um, we're approaching 50 years old, and they're needed replacement. Um, roof and drain replacement. Thought we would feature this architectural element um, 
but you know how much we admire that. But if you're okay getting rid of it, we're okay. Um, exterior doors and windows, not a lot of windows to replace, but there are a few. Uh, interior finishing, furnishing, other things are the same here, except for the plumbing supply piping again. Uh, this building has issues with leaks in the supply piping, so we would recommend replacing it all when you remove ceilings and renovate the building. Um, lighting technology. 23 to 30 million is the range on this building. Fair in areas with windows, poor in areas without windows. And for those familiar with the building, make up a good 90% of the rooms. So a little higher impact on the windowless, poor areas in this one. And the uh, renovate replacement ratio of 53%. And then uh, last school facilities, senior high school has the construction date in 66. Additions 2001 to the partial renovations of 3, 14. Um, the building area, obviously, the, this facility is your largest facility. Just a little bit better than 300,000 square feet, 97, 94 acres. Um, the current enrollment 1143, and then the calculated capacity of 1120. So you see that the equalization rate is showing that the high school is overutilized based on the enrollment. Um, but if you pull the ninth graders out of there, we'll find that the high school is probably slightly under 100% capacity, but uh, it's that, again, that skewed. Paving side improvements and plugged in things like the uh, facilities that were done in uh, 14. Yes. The turf fields uh, need to be replaced within the next 10 years. Uh, uh, 10 years on, I don't know if you have an idea of when you think you need to replace those. About five years on. Okay. Five years. All right. Brick repair. Glass block replacement. Uh, partial roof, exterior doors, which this is an example. You have some great exterior doors, but some of your back of the house hollow metal doors are closer to the original. Um, interior finishes, furnishings, pool and auditorium improvements. Plumbing supply piping? Is that yeah. Right? Yeah, okay. yeah, locker rooms. Yeah, I mean, HVAC, lighting, technology, safety, and security. This is a large building, over 300,000 square feet. You're in the 36 to $47 million range to renovate all this stuff. To, <coughs> to renew status. Educational adequacy, fair to good. You have some beautiful parts of this building. Uh, the galleries, the student uh, common area there. Um, you have a lot of great stuff going on. Renovation replace ratio of 43 um, percent. Taking a look at some of the other district facilities, so uh, Memorial Stadium, obviously the original construction date of 51, additions 2001. Uh, the building area, so this is really looking uh, specifically at the maintenance and locker room uh, area and uh, grandstand. Um, and the site area of 15.7 acres. Obviously no utilization here, we're not really factoring this in as a uh, as an educational facility, if you will, in the same fashion as the others. Great asset. Um, so the things that were identified there, 10, 10 years, repaving all the parking out there. Uh, we recommend replacing the field lighting to an LED. And right now you have you don't have LEDs and you have standards out there that were original with the building that can be maintained, but when you replace it, they should probably all go together. Track resurfacing, roof repairs, press box improvements, locker room improvements, and the 1.8 to 2.5. You can certainly do more there. What do you like? <laughs> the district office, the construction date 1960, uh, building area about uh, 9,800 square feet, uh, about 0.4 acres. Um, I'm not sure if that includes the parking lot. It does. Yeah, so it's probably a little bit uh, larger than. 
dairy and how like there is a four, point four acres of parking behind it is some addition. Um, either plan on roof replacement, repaving, and rooftop HVAC unit replacement in the next 10 years. This is a half to basically three quarters. All right, so this is a total of all of that. 91 to $121 million to bring your existing buildings up to the renewal ones. And this, this has a little bit of educational adequacy improvement in there based on some comments that we've heard so far, but it doesn't yet include the educational vision and the impact of that. Um, your buildings have been very well maintained. Most buildings I see uh, of you know the 50, 60 year range, um, they far surpass the replacement, the, the 60 to 70 percent range, uh, just because most most school districts don't put as much effort into maintaining the buildings as you have. So you're in a great position. Um, none of those buildings calculated above 60 percent. So none of them are just out of hat and being recommended for replacement. So you have almost 800,000 square feet of school building. You have another 64,000 between Memorial Stadium, um, the um, administration building, and your athletic outbuildings here in the high school. Here's the, the key opportunity that you have uh, and that the community advisory team will need to wrestle with in developing that master plan. And that's why we do master plans, to take a look at this stuff. This year you have 3,398 students. Your buildings have a capacity of over 4,500 on a, on a reasonable capacity. Um, and this is at the K-8 level. Your high school doesn't have that capacity. If the junior high wasn't there, you would be crammed with a guild here with the students that you have this year. Um, as we look out into the enrollment projections that uh, the Department of Education has done for you, um, and based on what we know of general demographics and all, you're likely to remain relatively flat or declining in enrollment. So we don't see the likelihood of going much above you know, 3,400, you know, maybe get up to 35 sometime, some swing. But, but as I looked at your enrollments, your current enrollments, um, your kindergarten, first grade, your early grade levels, are running more in the 230 to 250 student range. The students in your high school right now, those classes are above 300, in some cases, per grade. So you've got, you've got fewer students coming in behind the back door. So that would indicate that you're going to have some reduction as those students go out of the If we just take this number around 3,400 and compare it against your capacity, you have up to 150,000 square feet of excess space that you're maintaining, that you're cleaning, um, and that if, if the final master plan, and again, this may be the answer, if the final master plan is we want to keep all the buildings we have and improve and renew you would have about 150,000 square feet more than you absolutely need to deliver education. Um, but your district has a lot of other things to be to, so there may be great value in the community of having some additional space. It's not bad from an educational standpoint to have flexibility of additional space, but when you get to the financially responsible community support of the site, what does it cost you to have that? 
that will be a key part of the consideration as we go through master plan. So that's the information that we've uh, had a chance to sort of pull together uh, on the facility assessment side. And that process will, will continue. We'll continue to gather information as we go uh, further uh, through the educational visioning and into the uh, educational test fit. Um, I want to spend a second to talk about the educational visioning process just because I think you're going to start to hear more about this because uh, that process is going to start up in March. Um, and so um, just as a little bit of a uh, kind of process update on how this group is going to come together. Um, we're, we're in the process of, of pulling together the educational visioning teams and right now uh, the format of that is going to be uh, both a community group and a student group uh, and the idea is that those two are going to feed into each other so we may have a community group meeting uh, in the evening and have a student group uh, meet in the afternoon and they're going to be working on concurrent exercises and those exercises are going to feed into uh, the overall visioning process. So you can see up here, you know, our goal is to get a student group of about 30 students together. Uh, we typically work with sort of fifth grade through 12th grade students. Um, have, I think we find that we're going to get more value out of working with some of the older students. It's not that the, the elementary school students uh, don't have a, a say or have a, have a place in that sort of conversation. Uh, but fifth grade through 12th grade, I think the students are a little bit uh, uh, better versed at, at just sort of explaining what they need educationally and helping us understand that. Um, the community groups are 50 to 40 to 50 participants. We try to make that a, a sort of broad-based group. It's not just school staff. It's also going to be parents, and community members, uh, higher ed partners, um, staff administration, um, and uh, we're going to work on a number of different um, sort of exercises. And the the goal of the educational vision is really to understand the shift, um, and the shift is is about where we are today educationally and where we want to be in the future. That's the shift, and so we'll work with you. Uh, to develop uh, uh, components of key areas to talk about what those shifts really need to be uh, and what we need to do in order to get from here to there. Um, so you see the educational visioning team um, and if you take a look at the process, sort of go through three key uh, meeting, uh, sort of defined meetings if you will, so the confirm and clarify, the define and refine, the ideate and conceptualize. And again, we're going to work with both of those teams and those exercises. Um, and they're really going to feed into each other. I think the best definition or description of that is what you can see up above, is working with both of those teams in these, uh, in these exercises. And th these are fun exercises. Um, there, there's a series of, of uh, sort of surveys that we go through and some, uh, some games that we play in order to sort of get people uh, thinking about the relationship of, uh, of, of students in space and thinking about how um, those, those components come together and, um, we might work with the team to sort of divide, uh, design a classroom pod, if you will, and think about what the relationships of, of a group of classrooms might be, if it's a grade or if it's an interdisciplinary team, um, and sort of think about the future of education that way. So um, we're going to go through a series of, you can see up here, sort of three meetings, and then the fourth meeting is sort of a culmination where um, we'll pull together that educational vision with both of the teams. And that fourth meeting might be both of the teams meeting together, which comes from talking. So that brings us back uh, to the, uh, the master planning timeline. Um, the main uh, key thing that I want to leave everybody with is, is that uh, as far as the community is concerned, there are multiple times for the community to get involved uh, and to get updates. Um, so not only um, you saw the, the website, so that, that website is, is live and this presentation is going to go up there uh, probably tomorrow. Um, and as we go through the educational visioning process, all the educational visioning, um, each one of those presentations is going to go live on the website. Um, there are places on the website for you to be able to ask questions. So if you um, want to be a part of one of these teams or uh, you want to um, ultimately ask a question about something that's in one of the presentations or one of these uh, videos from the community forums, um, there's a place for you to, to get involved there. Um, and ultimately, we're going to also be looking for folks uh, to get involved in the community advisory team. So as we get later in the year, we start thinking about master plan. So our goal again, we want to reach as many uh, members of the community as possible. So this is just a first step. Uh, and so with that, I think I'm going to um, wrap it up. The big close. The big close.
be surprised. Uh, what this is going to deliver for you is a facility master plan that is educationally fantastic, financially responsible, community support. If we achieve those three things, you'll be successful. Where was I hiding? I hit the concession stand. What are you talking about? A, a couple of takeaways from what we've heard. Our buildings are well maintained. So please don't walk away from here thinking that your kids go to school or your grandkids go to school in, in buildings that are falling apart. They have been well maintained, which is why we've been able to get the life out of them that we have. But the second takeaway from tonight is we are approaching a crossroads. We're not there today, but we're getting very close. And we need to spend the next year figuring out what we want, need, and have to do to provide our kids and our staff with the best facilities possible to match our educational process. I talked to our foundation, I talked to our, our conservation trust and some other groups as we stepped into this process. And the thing you need to keep in mind is this. I could hit the Powerball tonight. I do play every day. And I hope that I hit it big. And if I wrote a check to the Greater Latrobe School District for $150 million to do everything that you saw on these screens, a blind slate, and we could get started with that process of reimagining, rebuilding, renovating, reconstructing, if we could start that process tomorrow, it would not be completed for three to four years. That's why we're talking about this today, because it doesn't happen overnight. None of it happens overnight. It's a process. We talked about LES for a year. We designed LES for 18 months. And the construction of LES took 18 to 24 months on a fresh piece of property. That's not a renovation. That's a build. Add it up. That crossroads is getting closer. And we need to start to have these conversations now. And I want to have you as a part of this conversation. Folks, I'm on the back nine of my career. I probably won't see the product that comes from this meeting that starts tonight. But I'm okay with that because we have to set this process in motion so that we can provide for the next generation. So that we can provide for as many kids from this current generation. And so that we can truly say that we are Greater Detroit and we are providing first class facilities to match the first class education that goes on each and every day in our classrooms. I appreciate your time. We did give you a survey. I would ask that you fill the survey out. Uh, if you didn't get one, they're on the table uh, where you came in. At this point, I would say, and I may not have answers, do you have questions? Sir. Boy, what a move that was. 
watching those kids go from one school to another on school buses with uh, uh, their bags of, of classroom materials, watching teachers pack up crates because Mr. Thomas limited them to, what was it, two and a half crates per teacher. <laughs> but uh, just watching that whole process, I mean, that was pretty much a seamless transition once the building was ready. And that's an ideal situation. I was through a renovation myself when I was in high school, when we got shifted and moved around. Never had to go to uh, trailers or anything like that, but at, at Bagley and Mountain View, I know that was an option. But we're pretty far away from that. Closer than you think, though. Any other questions? You have the opportunity to jot down questions on the materials that we gave you when you came in. As the uh, gentleman had said before, uh, I want you to go to the, the Greater Latrobe website because I'm, I'm proud of the future GLSD site that popped up today. Um, it is first class. It gives you the opportunity to post questions, track our progress, follow the, the timeline that has been set out here. It's time for our community to come together. There's been too much division and too much strife over the last two and a half years. It's time for us to come together around something. And if it's providing first class opportunities for our kids, I think that's something that we can all rally around. Again, I appreciate your time and being here. I know you probably had a million other things to do. Um, I'm available. If you want to talk to me, we're available at the end. But thank you very much for being here. Thank you.